Calvin, thanks for coming and talking to me today. Not um, at all. The theme of the discussion is going to be about history and essentially the leftist woke rewriting of history mm. and, and the weaponization of history. Yeah. Uh, we'll get to that, um, but can we start with you and your career in education, actually, because I'm in education myself. I've, I've been I'm lecturer. sorry to hear that. I've been a lecturer um, in higher education for the last 20 odd years. What what was it like being, well, I suppose being a teacher in, in high schools, weren't you? Yeah. But, but also being a, a conservative teacher. Yeah, it was a big surprise to me, actually, because I'd been in industry before that. Yeah. So I could be sat next to someone who voted Lib Dem, sat next to someone who voted Labour, opposite someone who voted Conservative. And we were all in it together, working on our designs, our programming. Mm. Um, we used to create mobile apps and websites, that kind of thing. But right. it was an environment with different people yeah. from different backgrounds, with different opinions mm -hmm. and thoughts. And that's how I thought the world was. And then I entered education. <laughs> and it's not. It's not at all. It's really a groupthink mentality. It's a hive mind. And what was shocking to me was the treatment of people outside of that group. Okay, so I mean, that's you, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, well, what happened to you? Well, on many occasions, different things. But the first time I really realized that something was odd was during a general election. I can't remember which one it was. But in the staff room, um, someone said to me, you know, who are you voting for then? And I, I didn't realize that that was a rhetorical question in a yeah. staff room. Yeah. You're supposed to say, well, Labour, yeah. obviously, because yeah. we're not evil. We don't hate kids, yeah. uh, although some of them did. Yeah. Um, I said, I'm voting Conservative. Uh, it was like, you know, people were gobsmacked. Yeah. Jaws hitting the floor. I don't know, well, well, surely, you know, half the population votes Conservative. Yeah. Uh, so that was the first eye opener. Yeah. But I didn't learn my lesson. I didn't keep my mouth shut. But the problem from then on in that school, and I didn't stay there that long, was that any time the Conservatives uh, implemented a new policy that they didn't like, or there was a press release or a news announcement that Conservatives... It came back to you. Come to me, as if I, as if I personally <laughs> was the Conservative government. Yeah. I think this was the uh, coalition at the time, actually. But yeah. you know, the idea was that anything that the Conservatives did or said that was wrong, it was yeah. my fault. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't come to you and accuse you of being an anti-Semite because Corbyn is. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't dare to dream that the, the two are linked together. Yeah. But they did, and that was really eye-opening for me. Yeah. But that wasn't the end of it. You know, right. Brexit was a massive one as well. I can imagine. So, what was the, yeah, what was the mood music like there when, yeah. when Brexit happened? I mean, I remember, but, but right. what was it like in, in schools? Well, I think that's the moment I started becoming a political commentator, actually, because I started yeah. writing about what I was seeing in schools, because I was like, you know, parents and people outside of the school environment need to know what's going on within these walls. Yeah. Uh, and the teachers were very upset about Brexit, all up in the lead up to the vote, up to the referendum. They were, you know, they couldn't get their heads around the fact that people yeah. would think differently to what they did. Yeah. There was no diversity there of yeah. thought and opinion. But what really, really struck me was the, obviously I was part of Team Vote Leave and I was out campaigning, never brought that into school. That was yeah. you know, something I did. My activism was outside of school. That was yeah. my, my hobby. Uh, but what struck me was the day of the referendum, the morning of it, I came into school and I was teaching computer science, nothing to do with Brexit. Yeah. The head teacher and the deputy head teacher pulled me aside on my way in, said, you know, come into the office, let's have a chat. Oh gosh, what have I done? I've been called into the headmaster's office. Yeah. Um, Calvin, we understand that you, you know, you're, you're one of them, you're, you're a Brexiter. Um, whatever you do, please don't mention Brexit today. I was like, wow, don't mention the B word. Why would I mention Brexit? I'm here to teach about you know, binary programming and yeah. assembler language and it, it has no relevance to what I'm here to do. Of yeah. course, no, of course I won't. I took what they said in good faith. But what I saw as I walked through the school that day was teachers almost crying to, to pupils. I know it's terrible, isn't it? I know. And we've got the same thing going on in America. They've got Donald Trump. He's going to get elected over there. It's so it was almost like a trauma. Yes, it was a it? trauma. They, so there's an announcement on the school PA system. The chapel is open for anyone who's particularly uh, feeling hurt by the referendum results. And they had, you know, the <laughs> EU flag. Instead of Jesus, instead of the crucifix, they had the EU flag. Well, that uh, that's how says, serious that, they are about all that this. That says quite a lot, really, yeah. doesn't yeah. it? You know, um, that's, that's really, really interesting. Okay, so you were a teacher, uh, and this was was this in London or this was in London? Yeah, yeah. and you were um, you were uh, an activist and campaigning and stuff like that, and then yeah. you've moved into well, essentially you moved into politics, didn't you? With yeah. the Conservative Party and the yeah. Brexit Party as yeah. well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did how did it go with the Brexit Party? 
fantastic loved it it was great um i'm a small c conservative yeah. first and foremost so I'm not that I like labels but just to put it out there where i stand politically mm. so i was with the conservative party or i always have been pretty mm. much with the conservative party but i didn't think they were going to get brexit done mm. i thought Theresa may being the prime minister was a mistake mm. she's a fantastic backbencher mm. and she's proven herself and she's proving herself as, as she's Absolutely. proving herself to be now yeah but she didn't seem to have what it took to lead the party yeah. and get us through yeah. brexit yeah. i didn't think it was going to happen and towards the end of 2019 i thought even with boris it wasn't clear you know it looked like brexit in name only yeah and it looked like the conservatives needed a push to make sure that democracy did happen you know there were so many elements at play the civil service most of the politicians in, in the houses of parliament did not want to see brexit happen yeah. i could see the machinery was against us mm. i didn't think we'd get the vote i never thought we'd win mm. but we did so i thought mm. you know we have to go with what the general public have said, what the voting public have said, that's democracy. Uh, but I thought it was gonna get uh, scuppered. So I thought, you know, I've got to do this. I've got to join the Brexit party, make a stand and hold the conservatives to account and drag them back in the right direction. Mm. And that's what I think the whole point of the Brexit party was. And I think it was amazing what it did. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was quite stunning really how quickly it all happened and yeah. how quickly it came together. Okay, so that's, <laughs> That's party politics. Mm. So if you could, difficult question this, right? If you could define your ethos, your yeah. kind of philosophy, if you yeah. like, your political philosophy, what, what would you say it is? Uh, first and foremost, Christian. Mm. So my faith is at the forefront of everything I do. Mm -hmm. So I always at least try to put Christ in everything that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I had to identify my politics, I would say small state. Yeah. So give people the freedom to live their lives. Mm. Um, the, you know, the, what we class as the British values, mm -hmm. democracy, the rule of law, tolerance mm -hmm. of people of different faiths and non, they're so important, mm -hmm. fundamental values that not everyone around the world celebrates. So yeah. we should hang onto them for dear life and, mm -hmm. and protecting civil liberties mm -hmm. as much as I'm, I'm not really libertarian, so to speak, but I do think that our freedoms are fundamental. And, you know, we used to say an Englishman's home is his castle. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has been destroyed over the last 18 months. Uh, we've forgotten what we stand for as a people, you know, Different countries around the world have different takes on what it means to be you know, a part of their nationality. In England, we've built our nationality around the land. You know, the, great, the islands of Great Britain mm. mean something and our common law has, has evolved mm. through that in that we were free to do whatever we chose to do in this land as long as we weren't going against the laws that explicitly mm. provid, pro, forbid us from doing things. Mm. Um, and that's all be flipped. Mm. We've gone to the American slash the EU model of you're only allowed to do things that we say as a government that you're allowed to do. Mm. Uh, and that is very scary. Well, it's scary, scary here. Um, it, it seems to be even more scary in Scotland. Um, and, and yeah, that, I mean, that's happening. So, OK, all of that stuff seems eminently reasonable to me. But would you say it's true to say that You've been singled out quite a lot on mm. social media, Twitter, and so on and so forth. And, and you've been on the receiving end of some real vitriol mm. and hatred, haven't you? Um, why? Why do you think? Um, because I rock the boat a little bit. And I think I upset the core of of what is the approved narrative. I mm. mentioned a group thinking education is it's, it's wider than just education. It is. Um, the left in general mm. have kind of painted themselves as the good guys and they've made a, an us versus them mentality. They've siloed off anyone that doesn't agree with them. And if you are part of that and you're, if you are speaking up and essentially breaking down what they're saying as a falsehood or, or bad, mm. then you are the enemy and you are to be destroyed. Well, I, th I think your case in particular, you're, you demonstrate very clearly that their position isn't really about ethics it's about ideology yes so the minute someone doesn't kind of fit into the box yeah. and, and 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 respond as they think they should do to all the characteristics yeah. then all hell breaks loose how, how did that impact on you i mean it's, it's not pleasant it's not something i enjoy um always feeling like you're in a battle um, but, you know, a good example of what you just said is the critical race theory argument. You know, on the left, they will say, we are the good guys because we want everyone to be equal. And of course, who wouldn't want equality, mm. at mm. least equality of opportunity? Opportunity. But what they're talking about is equity, yeah. not equality. And what they're talking about is, you know, that, well, they're telling people 
that there are so many barriers to, to ethnic minorities in this country that you can mm. never achieve anything. And I've, I've said it a million times, but it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that mm. if you tell people so often that they're held back, they'll start to believe it. Mm. And either they'll use it as an excuse mm. or they'll see their life through that prism mm. and feel held back. Whereas I stand up and say, no, you know, you can make anything of your life if you work hard enough. Doesn't mm. matter what color your skin is in this country. Mm. We're all equal under the law. Mm. And I'm a living, breathing example of that. You mm. know, mm. I've, I've achieved some successes. I've made some failures as well, but that's how life works. Yeah. And we should all acknowledge that if we don't get to where we want to be in life, it's not because of the color of our skin. It's because maybe we haven't worked hard enough or there are other circumstances at play. And we need to look at the wider picture mm. and not just assume that it's down to our race because that's lazy and ignorant and wrong. Mm. And by me saying that and living the life, my life as I do, I break down what they're saying and that their approach is the only approach that can fix racial inequalities. Mm. And the reason they want that is because that's how they get into power. That's how they get positions of control. I suppose that's what I was going to say. <clears throat> is it, the left supposedly empower, mm. don't they? Um, but by characterising certainly minorities uh, in terms of victimhood, yeah. they do anything but, don't yeah. they? Would you, I mean, would you say that's, would you say that's true? Yeah, yeah it's patronising, it's, it's wrong. I think the far left at this point have reached, it is that, you know, that shoehorn shape of politics, the far left have reached the elements of the far right yeah. where they are putting people into boxes based on their immutable characteristics and saying, you are this because of the way you were born and you can't control that about yourself. You, there's nothing you can do to change it. Mm. And that's wrong. We, we shouldn't be looking at the world like that. I'm not an individualist, but an individualistic approach is better than the collectivist approach in that everyone has an opportunity to change their lives, to mm. live their lives as they see fit. And no one should be putting them into labels or boxes and say, you, are, you belong in that group, you, you go on with stuff over there mm. and we'll do this. And we'll help you, of course. And how condescending is that? Like that just because you're brown, you need help from someone who isn't brown. It's, it's, Why? It's really condescending. It's really condescending. I, I, can I just segue into and bring history into it yeah. slightly now? And, and I'm going to do it via... Um, an experience that you had, and it was on um, talk radio, I think, and you were talking to someone called Ken Hind. And this was, you actually, you turned the Zoom off, didn't yeah, you? Yeah. What was going on in that? First time I've ever walked out to an interview, but uh, we were talking about Meghan Markle, actually, a, a person I really don't like, uh, for lots of reasons. But there's a common, this, so this is a good argument of, of it, how it breaks down the left's argument, actually, because yeah. they would say, you cannot be, you cannot criticize Meghan, because if you do, you're a racist, yeah. because she's brown. And I'm obviously brown myself, so I, I thought I'll criticise her because I don't like what she's done. I think yeah. actually she's lied on this point and that point, yeah. and that's inappropriate, immoral. I think she's attacking our British institution of the monarchy. But they can automatically say, you're a racist because I'm not white, which they would have done if I was white. They'd mm -hmm. say, you're attacking a brown person, you are racist, which is why I stood up and did it publicly and said, no, this is not appropriate. But what the person did is said, you're letting the side down. Mm -hmm. You are mixed race as she is. You should... You should Defend support her. One of, she is one of your own. You should support her. I should support her. No matter what she's done yeah. or what she's said. Because or... she's part of my tribe. And yeah. I'm, I'm, excuse me, she's not part of my tribe. If I belong to a tribe, it's my Christian brothers and sisters or my British uh, subjects. I'm not part of a tribe based on the color of my skin. And mm. for someone to silo me into that is racist. Mm. Mm. I mean, he, he justified um, what he was saying in, in, in two very specific ways that, that stood out to me, actually. One was historical trauma. Mm. He talked about historical trauma. Interesting that he accused me of having historical trauma, though. And the other was systemic racism. Mm. So can we come to historical trauma last? But mm. can, can you talk a little bit to me about this idea of systemic racism, yeah. what it is or what it's not? It's so problematic because I've spent so long talking about systemic racism, as in people always say that I think it doesn't exist or that so by me saying that systemic racism isn't so much of a problem that I'm saying that racism doesn't exist. So yeah. let me start from the beginning because racism is clearly a problem. It yeah. will always be a problem because we are a species that looks for the other in, in people when we want to attack them. Yeah. And we're, we're often quite ignorant. Mm. And if we want to offend someone, we'll look for, for something that's different about them and mm. use that against mm. them. Mm. You know, we see that in, in children. You know, if you have a ginger kid in the playground, they get bullied because they've got ginger hair. Yeah. If you're the only black kid in a school, that's probably going to be the thing about you that the kids will pick on. If or they, if you're the if only white to. kid in the school. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just, just, just to um, pursue that point a little bit further, the, the theoretical woke leftist would say, if, if you're black, you can't be racist. Right. So yeah. critical race theory would say that racism is a power struggle between white people and BAMEs or black and minority ethnics. Mm. And therefore, 
black people cannot be racist it's because they don't, they're not in a position of power, yeah. which is, always, of course, even that's not always true yeah. because it depends on where you're looking and what, yeah. what context is everything. Yeah, context is key. But of course, racism is prejudice or discrimination against someone based on the color of their skin. So mm. anyone can be racist. Mm. But this is another lefty thing as in redefining words to win an argument. Mm. Now, I've, I've seen and experienced racism on both sides. So I'm mixed race, I'm half white and half black. Mm. And I've experienced it myself personally on both mm. sides, mm. from black people, from white people. Mm. But I've seen it in both contexts. Mm. So where I grew up, I was the only black kid in my school. Mm. I experienced racism from the, as a teacher in London, very, a very foreign environment to me. I've seen schools where white British kids were actually in the minority and they were picked on and bullied because of the color of their skin, yeah. because of their race, therefore yeah. mm. racially profiled and racially bullied. Yeah. Um, it it's, you know, contradicts everything that the leftists would say mm. based on critical race theory. It falls apart. It's an argument that does not work, mm. which is, again, another reason why they want to destroy me and people like me who's, who hold the mirror up to them and show mm. them the evidence because evidence destroys their mm. feelings. Mm. It's not about facts. It is about their feelings. Mm. And you, you can't argue the two. They're mm. contradictory. Mm. Mm. And so this, this idea of systemic racism, right. you, you, you push back on that. And, and yeah, because, like I say, racism is a problem. It's yeah. everywhere. We need to stump it out where we see it. Mm. We need to challenge it absolutely but individual elements of racism does not make this the system racist mm. now if there are if there was a law that said you know you could only hire white people to be uh doctors mm. that would be systemic racism mm. quite clearly mm. because a black person would not be able to get to, to a position of equality in mm. the system mm. we don't have that we have equality under the law if you feel you're being discriminated on based on the color of your skin you could sue that person or that organization and they wouldn't want to be in that position mm. um, so i don't think we have many systems there are still some institutions in the country that might be considered racism mm. uh, racist but we'd have to look into them further mm. Mm. Uh, because this is another thing that every time we see uh, an instance of racial inequality or mm. racial injustice doesn't necessarily mean it's racism at play mm. Mm. And sticking to the healthcare system, people often say, well... Yeah. Well, representation is another thing, isn't there? Well, that's, you, representation yeah. is another one, but I'm, mm. I'm talking about inequalities. So, yeah. for example, black mothers mm. tend to die in childbirth at a higher rate than white mothers in mm. childbirth. Mm. Now, elements on the left will say that's clearly a case of systemic racism. The NHS is racist towards mm. black people. Mm. But, but that's just cherry-picking stats, because I can pick a, a stat and say, well, actually, white cancer patients die more frequently than black cancer yeah. patients. Therefore, the NHS is clearly systemically racist against white people. Mm. It's not. Mm. It doesn't pass the common sense test. It doesn't mm. make any sense. Mm. But there are clearly other elements at play, other mm. socioeconomic factors at play, as mm. there always are in our society. Mm. And as a Brit, you'll understand that, you know, class, wealth, background all have massive parts to play in, in our mm. outcomes in life, mm. far more than the color of our skin. But not to say that the color of our skin doesn't have an impact, but we have to look at the bigger picture. Yeah. And systemic racism paints racism as the core factor in people's lives. And why that's a problem is because if people don't get to where they want to be, they'll mm. say, oh, well, of course I didn't get where I wanted to be in life mm. because this mm. country is racist. It's mm. systemically, everything is against me. Mm. Mm. And that's not healthy for those individuals, but it's not healthy from people on the other end either. There's one point you made there, which is, is, is a really good way of, 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 of linking to the past. And it's this idea of cherry picking facts. Yeah. Now, we do that in the present and, and that, that, that certainly happens, doesn't it? And, and, and COVID, well, I, I suppose is a classic example of that. Yeah. But we do that with the past as well. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's one way of presenting a complex picture in, in quite literally black and white terms yeah. and, and, and in very, very simplistic terms. So let's get back to this idea of um, historical trauma then. What, yeah. what does that mean? So it's, I think it's coming from this idea of ancestral sin. And we've, we have kind of a replaced original sin in this country, which used yeah. to be a Christian country, with something called ancestral sin. The idea that if your parents or your parents' parents, or it doesn't matter how far back in your lineage you go, if your ancestors were somehow involved in not just the slave trade, but the British Empire in general, or colonialism in general, if they have some link to the British Empire. If then, they're on the same continent oh, on yeah, one quite, Tuesday. Quite. Yeah, yeah. Well, therefore, they are guilty, making you guilty mm. of systemic racism mm. and you can't apologize for that there's nothing you can do to get over your guilt i mean it used to be the sins of the father were yeah. the sins of the father right. now we, we we carry the sins of the father mm. when did that well it's a very anti -Christian when did that thing. change yes it is it's a very anti-christian thing but when did it change when did that start happening i think it's just part of the critical race theory 
uh, methodology because it's, yeah. it, they love a Kafka-esque trap. They love something that you can't get out of. Yeah. So they'll tell, you know, they'll say that white people are racist either overtly or covertly. Yeah. So either you are obviously racist in that you're acting racist, you're doing mm. things that are discriminatory, or if you're not, you must be covertly racist mm. because you're not showing it. You're not showing your racism, but you mm. are inherently racist. Yeah. And it's the same with this. Exactly I mean, there the is argument. nothing you can do there, no. is there? You're racist, but yeah. you don't know it. Yeah. So yeah. your ancestors yeah. were linked in some way to the British Empire, therefore you're guilty. And there's nothing you can do yeah. on this earth to undo what your ancestors may or may not have done. Yeah. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice catch, isn't it? It is. What, <laughs> what about this idea of white privilege then? I mean, my God, that's a thorny thing, isn't it? But what do you understand it to be? Well, my understanding is that somehow white, white people are more privileged in this, in this country than people of an ethnic minority status. And I don't think that's true. But if I'm being charitable, what the woke lot would say is that actually, no, what it means is that as a white person, your skin color doesn't hold you back, mm. but it does for other people, mm. which is not how I would use the term privilege. Um, but anyway, even that is untrue because obviously an example that I just used as a white kid in a, as a minority in a, yeah. in a London school or in yeah. a city school would be held back because of the color of their skin. A white working class boys in particular in this country. I mean, class is the big thing here, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, and, and that... It, well, it seems to me I might be wrong, but in in, in my experience, um, that that never is 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 really taken into account, or at least not in a meaningful way. People pay lip service to it a little bit. Okay, so if you were to crit critique yeah. white privilege yeah. and and really pull it apart, you've kind of been quite generous there and steel manned it. Yeah, pull it apart. Well, I'll, st I'll stick to my classroom example in that we're telling black boys yeah. over and over again that they have so many hurdles to overcome yeah. that they will never make anything of their lives because this country is against them. And we're telling white, pe white kids that they are racist, whether overtly or covertly, and they are harmful to the black kids. And it's causing division. It's stoking tensions where they didn't exist, where kids would once play together, not even seeing each other's race, just seeing friends across the classroom. They're now seeing Colour each other. blindness. Yeah, they're now seeing each other, which we should strive towards. We should aim towards Martin Luther King's, you know, treating people by the content of the character not the color of their skin what what are the consequences for those black kids well the consequences is, is that they resent white kids hmm. and racism grows amongst the black community as in the white person is the oppressor and the other way around white people become afraid of race they, they're no longer able to discuss race to the point that they are either scared of being seen as racist or scared that they are a racist and that causes division in our society hmm. but what it also does it stops us from fixing the problems. Mm. So as you mentioned, class is a massive divider in this country, mm. but we can't get to the issue of class because we're so fixated on the problem being race. Mm. The biggest problem isn't actually race in most of these circumstances. It's, it's class. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, which it's tells me that these people on the left don't actually care about making our society better because they don't want to fix the root of the problem. They just want to be seen as good people. It's virtue signaling. Talking of virtue signaling, let's get to decolonization. Mm. Yeah, let's, because it, it's, a, it's a term that really annoys me because first of all, the curriculum has never been colonized or if it was, it's no longer colonized. Yeah. And, and we were never a colony to begin with. So mm. the term doesn't make any sense mm. to decolonize something that hasn't been colonized. Mm. But secondly, what they mean by that is actually the same as diversity. It's removing whiteness. And they, they don't mean whiteness as in just skin color anymore. Whiteness is a- is, No, it's a concept. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a characteristic now. Mm. Mm. Uh, so they do literally want to remove dead white men from the curriculum because mm. they see males and white people, so white men in particular, as you know the bottom of their hierarchy of victimhood, mm. and they are pretty much the bad guys mm. uh, in the modern day. So it doesn't matter how fundamental the ideas are, how good the ideas are, how important those ideas are for us understanding our own lives. It's well, what does good mean? It who speaks. It is who speaks, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Content no, no longer means anything. You know, they've, they've talked about, some of these decolonize the curriculum campaigns have talked about replacing Mozart with Stormzy. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's helped shape our curriculum, helped shape the way we think about music and compose music uh, for centuries versus someone who has made a pop song mm -hmm. today and now, mm -hmm. who could very well be canceled tomorrow for something he says or does mm -hmm. by their own rules. Mm -hmm. it, it's nonsensical, it doesn't, there's no logic to it. You know, we, we forget about the canon it's all about looking good again. But then I come back to the question of what is good? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because, well, given, the, um, given what's happening, it's difficult to know. It's really difficult to know. 
The other thing about the curriculum as well, which is really interesting, is this idea that... How can I put it? You can only learn as a kind of mirror image. Right. So the only thing that you can learn that's good for you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, is so this idea of, of, of someone's knowledge that looks yeah. like you. Yeah. Isn't really the, the, the key idea for education is, is about transcending yourself. Isn't Absolutely. It? So we're supposed to teach the best that has been. Mm. We're supposed to teach, we're supposed to impart knowledge to the next generation. Mm. And it doesn't matter. So does Mozart's skin color has no impact on his work. Mm. And I can learn from that as a musician mm. or, you know, Shakespeare helped shape our language into what it is today. I can learn so much from his works and uh, his skin color has nothing to do with it. I don't need to see uh, a black author in order to take in good literature. Mm. I don't need to hear a black composer's music in order to take in good music. Mm. That idea is quite discriminatory, quite racist actually, mm. Mm. and patronizing. Mm. But that's the way they see things. That's, this is what we keep coming back to, isn't it? This idea of patronizing. Oh yeah. And it always seems to be these middle class kind of people imposing from mm. above. Mm. These, because they want these. to pat, pat the black man on the back and say, yeah. well done, yeah, 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 you're doing all right. It is very condescending. It's looking down upon them rather than seeing people as equals. Yeah. I mean, one of the one of the things that I'm interested in, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of conducting a few interviews for, uh, around the same theme, is the idea that the past is weaponized, mm -hmm. and and clearly, certainly over the last couple of years, post BLM and all of that kind of thing, the past has been weaponized, yeah. hasn't it? If you could speak specifically, do you think how how how's it been how's it been weaponized? Well, everything has moved into a binary context. So everything is either good or bad, mm. but based on their terminology of what good and bad means. Mm. Um, so no, no one is perfect in this world. So I'm a Christian, so I would say that we are all fallen, which means we're all flawed, we all make mistakes, mm. and that's perfectly okay. Mm. But from their terminology, if people don't meet their work criteria, they're bad guys, they're the enemies, they're to be destroyed and removed, wiped out of history, um, rather than learned from. So just some examples, you know, Edward Colston, Cecil Rhodes, you know, tear down the statues, they're gone, uh, they're no longer relevant because they were bad guys. Mm. Forget about the idea that these people set up, you know, endowments mm. and scholarships so that people could go to go into education. Mm. Uh, forget the idea that they set up almshouses, mm. hospitals, charities, uh, all of these great things. They did good works and helped shape their communities. Forget all of that because mm. they also had some bad in their past as in they were linked to slavery and or the uh, empire in some way. Mm. It's not looking at history holistically. It's breaking it down into black, white, good, bad. But again, based on their idea of what good and bad means. And there's something missing as well, isn't it? And, and quite a few commentators have, have picked up on this, particularly Douglas Murray, actually. I think it's the last chapter in his um, Madness of Crowds book, which is about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Actually talking to a Christian about forgiveness. Yeah. That doesn't figure, no. does it? No. There's no forgiveness on Twitter. No. Not at all. And there's no forgiveness... For the past, yeah. is that? Why is that? I don't know why it is, but it's certainly a major part of cancel culture and that once you've been cancelled, that's it. And it doesn't matter when you made the mistake or when you broke their rules or them, because they've defined their own moral code, essentially. Yeah. It is becoming a religion. They've, they've done away with Christianity and now wokeness is a religion in, in and of itself. And if you break their moral code, you are, um, what's, the, what's the word? Um, when you're booted out of a, of a religious sect, Oh, um, I, I know what you They're mean. Excommunicated, yeah, yeah, so yeah. to speak, um, and that's that's what's happening. So, uh, as part of my faith, if you well, because we're all so fallen, because we're all so flawed, mm. forgiveness is a key fundamental in Christianity. Because we have to, well, we first of all repent. When someone repents, when someone apologizes, you acknowledge that and you show mercy or forgiveness. Mm. Uh, but without that, nobody can come back. So people who wrote something on Twitter 10 years ago can get cancelled today for that very thing. Or, or like we said, someone whose ancestors may have made a mistake, they can still get cancelled for that. And it, and it just no happens back. in this way that just spirals and spirals and spirals. So I'm thinking about the cricketer who rightly calls out racism. Um, but does it in a way that's, that, that's really, you know, is, is kind of showboating in a way. Yeah. And then... You know, he gets he gets done for being anti-Semitic. Well, the problem you know? here is that so with most religions, the moral code is absolute. Yeah. So I know what the moral codes are in Christianity, mm. but in wokedom, it's ever changing. Mm. So people like J.K. Rowling, who at one minute were like the wokest person on the planet, absolutely all for mm. LGBT movement. So everyone's all she must be amazing. Mm. Say something uh, in favor of mm. single sex. Yeah. 
which is considered anti-trans, mm. therefore she is now cancelled. And just, I mean, just on people. the day we're doing this interview, she's tweeted something today, actually, right. or yesterday, uh, about Orwell and, 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 and a similar kind of thing. So, th so there's, there's that into it as well. But that's it. It's a self-eating snake because they will out-cancel themselves eventually because you can never out-woke the woke. Mm. It's constantly shifting and you've got to keep up with it, otherwise you're done. One of, and this kind of relates to that a little bit. One of the things I'm really interested in is why we as a society seem to be so enamored with the revolutionary change we must be changing all mm. the time change mm. revolutionary you know at destroying mm. the past we're talking about the past and, and one of the things that you know my god the past is flawed and, and it's in any country as, as in this country it's flawed but there's this process of annihilation going on and 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 a year zero mentality yeah. why this is a really difficult question right but yes. why why are people and the institutions in particular i'm thinking about yeah. here who should be interested in tradition as much as they're interested in change yeah. why are they so enamored with the revolutionary and why are they not interested in conservative ideas about conserving yeah, as far as i see it it's because we're arrogant uh, we think we're better than our forebears we think oh of course we understand all this stuff now they didn't get it they were all ignorant there's that element to it but of course we also think that change or progress rather is linear mm. we think progress is always a good thing mm. change is always a good thing mm. and i don't think that's true i think there are peaks and troughs especially in society um you know the fall of rome is a good example that that's where i think we're heading at the moment mm. we're, we're heading so much in one direction mm. that we're forgetting the things that hold our society together mm. you know community duty service mm. or loads loads of really good values that we've yeah. just uh, demolished um okay so here's the really difficult question then mm. what can we do about it we just have to become more active. I think naturally conservatives are quite passive in general. We'll just let other people get on with stuff as long as it doesn't personally impact us. That's, you know, it's quite a libertarian stance or a classical liberal stance actually. It's very fair, but we need to make sure that we are conserving things because you know, people say that conservatives are very bigoted, very old fashioned, they want to hark back to the past, but it's not about that. It's about preserving the past so that it's there for the future. Mm -hmm. We protect the past for future generations. Mm. That's our job as conservatives. And there's something else as well that, that um, occurs to me as you say that. And I think one of the things that conservatives do is not get involved in the detail. Mm. The things that they don't like, they say, oh, that's going on, or it's, it's political correctness gone mad, or it's mm. this, or it's that, or the other. They need to understand, don't they? Mm. They need to know what's going on yeah. to be able to kind of meet these arguments head on. Yeah. So is, is that something else that's important? Do you think? Absolutely. The small detail is another thing. And all, also, culturally, we need to be engaged. So at the moment, the vocal minority, the woke lobby, whatever you want to call them, there's a, an approved narrative there that they are perceived as right mm -hmm. or righteous and good. And I don't think they are. I think they're, destru they're a destructive force on a society. Mm -hmm. But I think the majority are conservative in this country, small c conservative, mm -hmm. and we need to stand up and let our values be known mm -hmm. and let it be known that actually we don't believe in all of this stuff that they're shoveling. Mm -hmm. We don't believe what they say is right. And we need to say what's wrong about it and show them what is right for this country. Yeah. Positive alternative. Positive alternative. Okay, to finish, what's eating you at the moment? What's really on your mind? Um, this idea that I don't regret voting Conservative in the last general election, but I do regret not getting a Conservative government. This idea that we're trying to spend our way out of a pandemic, this idea that we're no longer conserving anything, whether it's our history or our culture, this idea that we're no longer protecting civil liberties. Mm. Every, every single value that I hold dear, that I thought this party and this government held dear, is being stomped all over. And if we can't, Rel I mean, you, just to, again to interrupt, sorry, are you frightened yeah. by that? The, the Absolutely, because if we can't rely on people on our own side to defend what we hold dear, who can we rely on to? I think the left, as in the Labour Party, would have done everything that the Conservative government's done, but harder and longer. So who is standing up for Conservatives in this country right now? It's a good question to end on. Thank you. Not at all. My pleasure. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel, and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, 
newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you. Thank you.